In the second part of chapter 9, we're going to continue our discussion on the remaining endocrine glands, starting off with the adrenal gland. And this gland sits right above the kidney. So there's one over here. So there's one on each over each kidney. And if you notice, it splits into two reg different regions. This inner area this is called the medulla, and the outer region is called the cortex. This is also very common in the kidney and also your brain. Remember that outer region of your brain is going to be the cortex, inner is going to be the medulla. Kidney, if you take a cross section of the kidney, putting it in half, it's going to also be separated inside the medulla, outside it's going to be the cortex. If we look at a cross section here of our adrenal medulla, we notice that this adrenal cortex is going to be composed of three different layers, and it's called glandular region because all it's going to do is secrete different types of hormones. Now this inner area is called the uh, adrenal medulla, and it's an inner neural tissue region because it's going to be our central and peripheral nervous system that's going to stimulate the release of the endocrine hormones from the inside of this medulla. Here are the three different layers that um, comprise the adrenal cortex. We have mineral corticoids. This is the outermost region. Then we have the glucocorticoids. And then we have the sex hormone secreting area. And we're first going to start off with the middle corticoid region. Mineral, given that name because it deals with mineral content that's being regulated, specifically sodium and potassium. Um, and because we're going to deal with sodium and potassium, we can maintain our water balance and also electrolyte balance. And thereby, if we can regulate this and this, we can also regulate the amount of water entering and exiting our kidneys. And therefore, we can also regulate blood volume and blood pressure. Let's take a look at that over here. And so here, we just see that this mineral corticoid layer, what this secretes is a hormone called aldosterone. Now, what exactly does aldosterone do? Aldosterone works downstream here, and what aldosterone is going to do is going to increase the absorption of sodium. And if you remember osmosis, this is going to be within our kidneys. Here we have a kidney collecting duct. If sodium gets out, so if we're going to increase water absorption back into the body, and anything that exits over here, the collecting duct, this is going to form urine. So if we reabsorb sodium back into the body, what's going to happen to water? Water is also going to follow. And because water follows sodium, what happens then? You're going to increase the blood volume. If you have a lot of fluid then within your blood vessels, in turn you're going to increase your blood pressure. And because aldosterone does these key effects, we can control and have different stimuli to whether increase the simulation of aldosterone or decrease the simulation of aldosterone. And so there's two upstream ways that we can cause aldosterone to be secreted. The first one is if there's too little sodium or and there's too much potassium in the blood, then we're going to have this direct stimulation to increase sodium re uh, reabsorption and then also secrete potassium out into the urine. Also, if you have a decreased amount of blood volume or and blood pressure, how are we going to change that? Well, we can just secrete aldosterone. We're going to cause our mineral corticoid layer to secrete aldosterone. This in turn is going to reabsorb sodium, increase blood volume, and increase blood pressure once that water follows. Now, another thing that can happen is stress. So in the event that someone is stressed out, you can re uh, release what's called adrenocorticotropic hormone that's going to target your mineral corticoids to also secrete aldosterone. Now all of these will simulate or stimulate the release of aldosterone. But what about what works antagonistic to it? Remember, you always want to work in a negative feedback mechanism, and you can do that by having some sort of hormone or other component that works in opposite. And so here we have what's called atrial natriuretic 
peptide, R-A-N-P, and this is one that you want to know because what's it going to do? It can inhibit the production of aldosterone, and what's it going to do? Well, it's going to reduce blood volume and reduce blood pressure. So this is the inhibitory effect. It's going to stop this secretion of this aldosterone. Moving on to the next region we have is glucocorticoid secreting area. And what this does, it secretes two different types of hormone, cortisone and cortisol. And this is necessary for a couple of things. We have normal cell metabolism. And also we're going to release these two hormones in response to stress. And how is it done? It's done by triggering. It's triggered by the adrenocorticotropic hormone from the anterior pituitary gland. Now another important thing from glucocorticoids we can do, can also decrease edema in the event if the area is inflamed, so in, the, in, in response to inflammation. And it can also inhibit pain by causing molecules such as prostaglandins to be secreted into the body. Let's take a look here of how, uh, how those cortisone and cortisol works. In the body, here we have cortical, adrenocorticotropic hormone being released by your anterior pituitary gland. It's going to get released into our bloodstream directly and it's going to affect our adrenal cortex. Now, mineral corticoids, we just saw this, it can alter the amount of sodium and potassium within our cell and thereby um, dictate the amount of blood volume and blood pressure we have in, within our body. Glucocorticoids also can respond to long-term stress because since it deals with metabolism, we can either convert all these proteins and fats to glucose or break them, break them down for energy. Again, also what we can do is increase blood glucose levels. We want to increase all that glucose towards our cells and tissues and produce at high amounts of ATP. And also what happens is you suppress the immune system. Now, both glucocorticoids and mineral corticoids work collectively together during this long-term stress response. And so if you ever notice during your finals week, if you get stressed out, what happens? You tend to get sick. And that's because of the suppression of your immune system. So this one is a more prolonged response. Um, also, typically people who aren't living in the greatest conditions have this long-term stress response. Continue to break down that fat, increase that blood glucose levels. Now let's take a look at this next layer of the adrenal cortex, and that's going to be the sex hormone secreting area. And this is mostly androgens within males that are secreted and estrogens and within females that are secreted from this area. A lot of times these effects are masked because we have the ovaries and we have the testes secreting their hormones, specifically progesterone, estrogen, and testosterone. Therefore, these effects are pretty much hidden. However, these also contribute to secondary sex characteristics, steepening of the voice, and also maturation of the female reproductive organs and structures. Couple of um, diseases and disorders if we don't have that homeostasis. The first one is Addison's disease. This is hypo, so little secretion of all the adrenal cortex hormones. And what happens is, well, you feel burnt out very easily. Well, why is that? Well, you don't have that metabolic ability to break down those food storages to release glucose to convert that to energy. Your muscles are weak also due to that decreased ATP availability and also decrease of that synthesis of those proteins. And you are more susceptible to infection because you have a decreased immune response. Hyperaldosteronism, this is from an ACTH releasing tumor. And if we're going to think about this mineral corticoid level, we're going to have excess water and sodium retention. If we're going to continue to stimulate mineral corticoids, continue to secrete aldosterone, that in turn will lead to this high sodium retention high water retention, therefore blood pressure, and then edema, which we're going to see in a couple of chapters. Edema is also due to having that high blood pressure and not having a lot of that return from those fluids and, and those tissues into your blood vessels. Now I do want to look at one more thing, 
And I don't think that I mentioned it earlier, but I do want to highlight this. I don't recall if I mentioned it earlier. However, going over right back here, I want you to notice, um, since I didn't fail to mention this earlier, not only do we have this decreased sodium and potassium stimulating your aldosterone level, you also have your stress response, so that's also going to stimulate aldosterone, short-term response of stress, but you also have this decreased blood volume and blood pressure. When that happens, you're going to cause your kidney to secrete renin. Renin, in turn, is going to cause a chain of reactions to initiate and activate angiotensin II, and angiotensin II directly is going to cause the production of aldosterone. And so therefore you have two stimuli really, or three, including ACTH, to stimulate aldosterone release to increase blood volume and increase blood pressure. So here's the first one. Here's the second one through renin. And you also want to know angiotensin II. And then finally three is through adrenocorticotropic hormone. And then once again, ANP is going to be in the antagonistic hormone. Let's move forward and get back to these disorders. Masculinization, this is due to a hyper secretion of sex hormones. And also this can lead to that beard appearance, even in females and male distribution of hair growth. So excessive hair growth, both in males and females. Now the next area we're going to look at is the inside of our adrenal gland, and this is going to be the adrenal medulla, produces two similar hormones which we collectively call catecholamines, and this is epinephrine, which we also call adrenaline, and norepinephrine, which we call noradrenaline. And what this is going to work on is for the short-term fight-and-flight response of our body. And we mentioned earlier that these are going to be considered a part of our nervous tissue or nervous glands, so neural tissue region, and why is that? It's because it's connected directly towards our nervous system. The moment we're undergoing stress, we, want to, we need that quick, fast response of our body. Here we can have that message sent directly towards our brain and spinal cord. Brain and spinal cord is going to send a message down through this nerve into our adrenal medulla to cause a release of either epinephrine or norepinephrine. What do these do? Both of these catecholamines are collectively increase your heart rate. They can increase your blood pressure by increasing the amount of sodium into retaken into your body and therefore increasing water retention. We can also work through antidiuretic hormone in this case. Your liver is going to convert all that glycogen to glucose to release glucose into the body. You're going to have dilation of your bronchioles. Why is that? Well, you need oxygen to your muscles and tissues and cells to increase all that ATP production. You're going to change your blood flow to increase your alertness and also decrease your digestive kidney activities. Fight and flight, once again, this is your sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system. Good, this is your sympathetic nervous system that you're tr uh, triggering. Also, you're going to increase that metabolic rate in order to break down and provide as much energy needed for the rest of your cells and tissues. So especially for this slide, know and differentiate between short-term stress versus more prolonged stress. What are the hormones that are involved in both? And then also what are the downstream effects? Next endocrine gland we're going to look at are the pancreatic islets. This is a mixed gland being both the endocrine because we can secrete hormones and exocrine functions because we can secrete digestive enzymes. So here is our pancreas, and if you ever take Bio 130 lab and you do your fetal pig dissection, you always want to look for the structure that kind of looks like baby corn, and that's the way I kind of remember it. So you'll probably never look at corn the same way again. Okay, let's first start off with endocrine pancreatic islets. So these are those right over here. So pancreatic islets are the glands that are going to create the hormones. Here we have two different types of hormones secreted by our pancreatic islets. Here's a closer view of that. We have first insulin, 
Insulin, this is secreted by our beta cells. And the way I remember this is if you eat a brownie, what happens? You're consuming a lot of that sugar. So do you want your sugar to be free floating within your body? No, you want to store it. So insulin is going to store all of that sugar. So what's it going to do? It's going to allow glucose, here's your cell. Insulin is going to allow glucose to enter into the cell and get stored as glycogen. Glucagon, what happens, this is when glucose is gone. This is when you don't have a lot of sugar within your body. So how do you change that? Not a lot of sugar in your body. This is going to be secreted to then break down glycogen and allow glucose to enter into your blood. And this is secreted by the alpha cells. And alpha cells are these guys here in red. And beta cells are the ones here in blue. Now another way you can differentiate this insulin versus glucagon, beta cells versus alpha cells. In the word glucagon, we have a letter A. And that stands for the A and alpha cells. Okay. And so of course, to maintain homeostasis, both insulin and glucagon have to work antagonistically to each other. Now, another thing, key thing, like I mentioned before, anytime you have to memorize a lot of things, make stories, create, try to create stories in your head. How do things work? Yeah, you don't really want to know. I have so many different stories in my head and kind of going a little crazy for how everything works within the entire body. But it helps. It all works. Here's this overview of how both insulin and glucagon work antagonistically to each other. Here's our normal blood glucose levels, which you want 90 milligrams per 100 milliliters. What happens after a meal? Well, you just, oh, this guy, this person ate four jelly donuts. I don't know about that, but I don't, well, malasadas. Okay, I can say four malasadas. I'd rather eat four malasadas than jelly donuts. Okay, so if you eat four malasadas, we'll just change that. Malasadas. Who eats jelly donuts? Well, I know some of you guys do, but anyway. So you have high amounts of blood sugar levels. What's going to happen? Which, uh, which cells are going to secrete insulin? Good, we have those beta cells going to see insulin. We're going to take in all that glucose into our cells. We're going to convert glucose into glycogen. There's lots of Gs here. So glycogen, once again, being that storage form of glucose. And then we're going to, what happens? So we're going to store that within our cells. And then that stimulus that we have lots of glucose within our blood is going to get shut off. So we're going to turn that off. Now we're at homeostasis. Let's look at what happens in the opposite direction. If you don't have a lot of blood glucose, if you skipped a meal, let's say you said, oh my gosh, I'm so sick of all those malasadas, I'm not going to eat anything for days, your glucose level systemically is going to decrease. We're going to sense that by our pancreatic cells. And what's going to happen? We're going to secrete glucagon because what happens? Glucose is gone. What are we going to do? We're going to break down glycogen to glucose, release glucose, and then we can have more systemic levels of glucose, and now we have homeostasis. Perfect. Let's take a look at a disorder that we all know and probably have heard about before, and this is diabetes. And we learned already insulin being that one hormone needed to move glucose from that bloodstream to the muscles, fat, and liver to be eventually be used as fuel. Now what happens with people with diabetes? A couple of things. The pancreas may not make enough insulin. The cells themselves do not respond to insulin normally, therefore they cannot take in all of that glucose from our bloodstream or a situation where they can have both of the above. Now there's two different types of diabetes that we know about based on the different populations they target and when they come into play. So one that's a congenital, meaning that you're born with it, this is type 1 diabetes and it targets children teens and young adults and with this type of diabetes the body makes little to no insulin and therefore daily injections are needed and this is pretty much a lifelong challenge for these individuals. This is different from type 2 diabetes which is developed or acquired, I shouldn't say it's developed, I should say more like it's acquired over time because of different factors. This targets adults and specifically one of the most common factors is obesity. Now why is that? Well here, let's just say here are your blood vessels and here are your normal cells that are going to take up all of those nutrients. People who are obese, what tends to happen is now you're going to start increasing the amount of adipose cells, adipose being those fat cells. So with all these adipocytes, it's going to make it harder for all those glucose molecules to transverse all these surrounding tissues 
to enter into your cells that need that actually need it. And so what happens is that those blood sugar is going to be make it more difficult to enter into cells, so especially as your muscles and cells that actually need all of that storage and energy. And it's going to make it harder for the body to use that insulin correctly. Okay, and over time what happens, the body does not produce, produce enough insulin or the cells themselves start ignoring that insulin stimulus. So for this also, people need injections of that insulin. And of course, with type 2 diabetes, another way to treat type 2 diabetes is by working out. And so that's very important to maintain a healthy body weight for both of these really regulating also your blood glucose levels. The next endocrine gland is the pineal gland. This is found on the third ventricle of the brain, and that being most posterior, close to the epithalamus, and then also that choroid plexus, producing all that cerebral spinal fluid. And a key thing I want you to note is that pineal gland, once again being posterior, pituitary gland being more anterior, and also pituitary gland being directly connected to that hypothalamus. And these three different endocrine glands are what students always get confused of whenever they have to identify it on a quiz or an exam. So this is why I'm telling it to you right now. Okay, what do we secrete? We secrete melatonin. This is going to help establish the body's wake and sleep cycles. And it's also believed to coordinate the hormones of fertility in humans. Next gland we have is the thymus gland. This is going to be posterior towards our sternum. Um, what does it produce? It produces thymosin. This is the maturation of some types of white blood cells. Specifically, it's going to help mature our T lymphocytes. And these are specific white blood cells that are going to be used in, for our adaptive immune response, which we're going to get into later down the line. And that's why it's important for developing our immune system. Now, patients with AIDS, which we're going to learn, those AIDS patients, uh, the virus itself is going to target these T cells. So it's pretty interesting to learn about that. Next, we have our gonads. In females, we have the ovaries, which are going to produce our eggs. They're going to develop in follicles. We have two hormones secreted by ovaries, both estrogen and progesterone. And then males, we have testosterone, and this is going to be the function to produce sperm. Looking at the testes first, we have several androgens. Those are sex, um, sex hormones. And the most important sex hormone in the males is going to be testosterone. And as we said earlier, within our um, within our our adrenal cortex, we do produce some sex hormones as well. However, majority of our adult male sex secondary characteristics, deepening of that boy, voice, the formation of the pubic hair, the height, the uh, masculinity of this male is all responsible for um, this testosterone. Um, and we of course need testosterone for the maturation of our sperm cells. In the females, we have the ovaries, which secrete estrogen and progesterone. Both estrogen, this is going to stimulate development of female sex characteristics, so development of the breasts and also um, the pubic hair and also the genital hair, uh, different hairs within the body. Um, progesterone, it's going to act with estrogen to bring about the menstrual cycle. And as we're going to see eventually, that if you imagine a brick wall, we have the bricks, and then you also have all this mordant, or you have the cement or concrete in between each of these bricks. Progesterone is going to act just like all of the cement, and estrogen is going to be just like of all these bricks. So collectively, they're going to work together to help maintain the structure and the inner lining of the uterus for implantation of that embryo. Now once, if we have a fertilized egg within the uterus, what happens is that over time the placenta that's developing is going to take over the commands to maintain that endometrium or the inner lying of your uterus. And so what's secreted by this placenta is what's called the human chorionic gonadotropin hormone or which is also known as HCG. And in pregnancy tests, this is actually what they're looking for. So that moment that the oocyte is fertilized, they're going to look for and detect for this hormone over here because that's how we know that the embryo is starting to develop. 
And so this is the very last hormone that you need to know for your exam. And that is all for chapter 9.